I think you were telling me recently that you were having an issue with, um, it was either delegation or like finding people that you could keep for long term. Are you still having that problem? Yeah, I think that really um, interesting. And, and I found um, it happened to many um, small, medium business as well. And, you know, honestly, we are not a big company, right? Or, so this is why um, we comparatively, it's not easy for us to find a good talent because sometimes for really, uh, you know, student or professional from um, um, top school, um, they might have more opportunities to get a job from the, you know, banks or international brands. So that's why a, a smaller company usually will be their second priorities. Um, so this is why we end up uh, as hard for us to compete really top talent from those um, big company which can offer really attractive package. And second, I think, um, you know, uh, honestly, when, when, when your company is small and you have to be really all-rounder, and which means your staff need to take to to be multitasking. <laughs> you know, um, I find uh, young people nowadays are more uh, they they really focus on work life balance. It's not a bad thing, uh, but I think that would add challenges to the company because you know they might have to uh, to to get more uh, hands to in the team. Yeah, so I'm not sure if this is like uh, our own issue, but I just found, you know, it, it, it's quite common in the small, medium sized companies now. So I've spoken to other company owners and uh, one of them I'm going to be interviewing later tonight. And that'll be the episode that comes out after yours. What he does is he also has a small team, I think is like 10 people, 11 people right now. What he does is he buys each one of them a VR headset. And so they can all play mini golf together virtually and things like that. So is there anything that you've been thinking about how you can better engage your team, especially because it's hard to find talent and it's hard to keep them? I think, um, you know, we offer really flexible work hour. I don't need my staff to be in the office nine to five. And second is we allow them to uh, work from home and and they usually you know request you know hey anna i have a yoga class this morning can i come later to the office and we're completely fine with that <laughs> and we do regular you know small event for the team let's say we go for um classes like you know fun activities or happy hour after after uh, office hours. So I think this is kind of like activities we are offering to our internal team now. But hopefully, you know, that would work. And but sometimes, you know, I, we, I don't want to give stress to the staff thinking, oh, you know, I need to spend time with my boss after office hour. <laughs> so one of the things I, I try to do is like, I'll set up something like that and then I won't show up. I'll speak, oh, guys, I'm so sorry. I've got something else to do. And that way, like, it's the right. team and not me. And that way they can just, like, because, like, if I leave it to them to organize stuff, they don't. So it's kind of on me uh, to make sure that they're doing things together. And I'll show up sometimes or I'll, I'll show up for part of the time because, you know, we don't have an office. So nobody's uh, in, physically together. You know, a lot of the people are in the Philippines. So some of them actually know each other in person and, and others, they don't have the opportunity to meet in person. But we're spread across nine countries or seven countries. So, you know, I've only ever met Mark, my COO, and I've just met my marketing director, Nicholas, like in, in Greece in April. And I'm about to meet my product manager, Jules, in Portugal in a few weeks. The other team members, you know, that's another like eight or nine people I've never met before. So oftentimes we only get an opportunity to, to do these things on Zoom or in virtual reality. So, so I'll, I, it's easy for me to slip in, you know, and out of an event. So for example, like when I was in America, I was 12 hours behind the Philippines. So if they're doing an event at 7 p.m., it's like, you know, 6 a.m., 7 a.m. for me. So I'm like, all right, guys, like, you know, I'm tired. I'm going to go back to sleep or I've got to get ready for work. Like you enjoy yourself. So um, so I try to I try to not be there the whole time 
or if, or at all, just so that they don't have to be like, oh, I don't want to spend time with the boss. But, <laughs> but I think they like it because they don't get a chance to talk to me too often. It's it's slightly different because Mark does a lot of the daily operations, and uh-huh. so I'm generally not engaging with all of the team members very often. Usually, I'll talk to Mark mostly, um, yeah. and I'll talk with our CTO some. And so I talk yeah. to the different people as needed. Um, so I try yeah. to let them be like the team, but then of course the team's like, well, we want to hear from you, you know? So like, I actually, one of the things I did was April was a tough month for us. So at the end of April, I did like a one-on-one call with all of the team members. And I was like, you know, what, what are you doing in your personal life? You know, how do you see our company as a whole? What do you think of our product? How do you think about this person you're working mm-hmm. with? Like, tell me good things about them that, you know, that you like, tell me things that you wish they could improve upon. So it, it wasn't a review. Like I knew from Mark and the other people, what, you know, these people are good at, what they're not good at, what their frustrations are. But I wanted to hear from yeah. them, you know, how they thought, uh, they were doing, how they thought I was doing. Some of them, you know, I'd say, what do you think I'm doing? You know, how do you think I'm doing as CEO? And they're like, to be honest, I don't even know what a CEO is supposed to do. I was like, okay, well, here's my defini- definition of what a CEO is. Based on that, what do you think? They're like, oh, well, you know, I think you're doing the best you can. I, I, I wish you would communicate a little bit more about our financial situation, or I wish you would communicate a little bit better about, you know, our roadmap. So um, I got a chance to learn from them kind of where they are mentally with the team and the the product and the roadmap and, and me as a, as the owner. And um, so I think that's really cool because I completely ignored, it, it wasn't a performance review at all. A- every, everything that I knew about, I left that outside of the conversation. It was just a chat, just a, a video call, just to chat with me and the other person. And, and they were like, this is awesome. Like, thank you. Like, it's so nice for you to take your time to like, come and talk to me. I'm like, well, is it really that big of a deal? And one of the guys, he's from Pakistan. He's like, honestly, in my last job, I didn't even know who the CEO was. I never, I didn't know the guy's <laughs> face. I didn't know his name. I never had a conversation with him. So the fact that like you spent an hour on the phone with me is just incredible. I'm so appreciative. Like, thank you so much. Um, so you really don't know, you know, how much, how important your time is to building team culture and making them, you okay. know, happy. I have a question, you know, um, do sure. you think, um, is, is, is it effective to work remotely? And second is, would your staff feel alone, you know, because they have to work from home? They didn't get a chance to work in a team. Because sometimes I'm worried about, I have a, like, you know, um, staff, single number staff in China, Malaysia, Singapore. Uh, we have interns in US, but um, sometimes I'm worried that they might feel alone uh, they don't see uh, teamwork. They might have fantasy how a big company with a big team will look like, and that might be one of the reasons they resign because they don't feel they get enough support or see the people in the office. From a psychological point of view, humans need humans. So yeah. Is there a potential disadvantage to fully remote work? Absolutely. And that's why it's important for us as founders to create a culture that is inclusive of that, that allows those people to feel good and you know about their role, to know that they're cherished and respected and appreciated, to know that they are connected to a larger picture. And that's why these get-togethers, yeah. these virtual reality meetings, these town halls, you know, we, we had town halls before where we would just lay out a spreadsheet and go, this is how much money we have left. This is how much we're spending. You know, we know that some of you have asked for raises. Here's a situation. We can't afford it, you know? So we want, I think, radical honesty and and, and appreciation and just being vulnerable with your team is a, goes a long way to building trust with them. Yeah. Um, is there a replacement for working in the office? No. What's been fortunate for us is that a lot of the people we hire are engaged or married or already have kids. So (laughs) even though they may be physically isolated from the team, they're not physically isolated from the world. 
Now, no, what they choose yeah. to do with their time off, if they don't have other friends or hobbies or other things outside of their family, that's on them. And all we can do is just kind of nudge them to be healthy. Now, maybe there's an opportunity there to go, hey, let's have a health challenge this month. Let's see, you know, who can do as you know the most uh, push-ups. Maybe we get them to, you know, do push-ups every day while they're building up their ability to to do this challenge by the end of the month. You know, and you give them a reward, you give them a VR headset or you give them uh, an Amazon, you know, gift card. Like there's things you can do, but nothing replaces physical contact. Um, And yeah, Hong Kong is filled with young people and it's filled with single people and it's a very lonely city. I've spent I, I haven't lived in Hong Kong, but I've been to Hong Kong probably 10 or 15 times and usually for a day or two at a time. One time I stayed for two weeks. And Hong Kong is honestly one of the loneliest cities I've ever been in. So I think it's a lot worse for you than it is for for me, where the majority of my team is not in in the Philippines. Oh, the team is in the Philippines, mostly. So I think it's different for us. Yeah, I, I honestly, you know, Enos now is back to Europe. Uh, for summer holiday, I think um, it would be wonderful someday we are, I mean, myself no longer limited to a physical location, right? Like I can work remotely like you abroad uh, and I can still manage a local team or not necessarily local because my tech team now is in Pakistan uh, and I have chi- I have team in China. So I've but at the same time, I have, you know, um, girls here in Hong Kong. So this is why sometimes I think, uh, do I need to add more team members in in the office so they will feel, you know, there are more people, more energy. Um, yeah, so this is what I, I was being, has been thinking. I wouldn't add people to add people. But if you want to be able to go and travel while you work, then maybe you need an operations manager. You, maybe you need someone that's there to manage the events and the other things you do so that you have the energy to think about how you can 10x your revenue, You know how you can take your company to the next level, where if you're there and you're worried about whatever thing, whatever fire is appearing on a day-to-day basis, then you're you're not able to really think at a higher level. Especially if, especially if Inez is not in Hong Kong, then you have the right to not be in Hong Kong if you don't want to. I know we've talked about this a few times. You're like, I would love to go to Europe. You're like, you're like, I want to be in Europe. That's not fair, you know. It's like you, you are the only person limiting yourself from making that happen. If you want to be in Europe or you want to be in New York or whatever. You have to find a way to do it, whether that's increasing revenue to, to be able to pay that. someone to bring that. Yeah, what? I need to prepare that. You know, before the COVID, I was traveling, right? And now these two years and it's kind of challenging. Yeah, I know. I was in Vietnam for two and a half years and then I was in Miami for 11 months. So for me, like there, there's this term, I don't know if you've heard of it called revenge travel. Revenge? No, I don't see any revenge travel now. Like what? I, well, I Hong Kong cap like get used to staying. I I mean I was you know I was chatting with a friend and he barely hear people want to start travel like the local people. Uh, for mm. expat maybe yes because they need to go back to see the parents and they start sending their kids to study abroad. So um, many expat start you know planning their business trip or or, or, or trip leaving Hong Kong. Yeah. So the term revenge travel is like, for someone like me, I basically, like I said, two and a half years in Vietnam without leaving and 11 months in Miami, all I did was fly to Atlanta for a week. Or no, I drove to Atlanta because I was afraid to fly. So basically three and a half years for someone like me who's used to seeing five new countries a year, you know, all of a sudden for three and a half years, I can't go anywhere. So now I'm like, I'm going to go here. I'm going to go there. Like I'm planning on seeing six countries this year. You know, six new countries. I've already been to Greece, Slovenia, and now I'm in Spain. This is my third time in Spain, first time in Greece and Slovenia, about to go to Portugal in a few weeks. So for me, like the idea of revenge travel is like, I'm so pissed off at like being stuck in one place for so long that now I'm going to go everywhere I possibly can. That's revenge travel. It's like because of the pandemic, costs have gone up. Because of inflation, the cost has gone up. Because of the war in Ukraine, costs have gone up. But I don't care how much it costs. I'm going to do it anyways. That's revenge travel. Hmm. Hmm. 
I think now if you're running the podcast, it's easier for you to do that. Um, sometimes I was thinking if you are leaving your own country, you know, and, and start in the new one and start your business in the new country or city, and it kind of like you have to start from scratch again. You get what I mean? Because, you know, uh, why don't you just expand your business in, in the city where you have the most content? Well, for for me personally, I mean, the way that Nerve is set up is that it's meant to be a global software kind of platform. So there is no, it, it's different from FEW, right? Because your business is, is hyper-localized for the market that you're in. And even if you expand into another market, like Singapore or Indonesia, it's still going to be hyper-localized for that specific market, where Nerve is a single solution that's meant for a global market. So um, will we need to make minor adjustments for marketing for different markets? Yeah, of course, but it's different because you have physical events, you have people meeting locally there. Um, and with the podcast, which I'm now turning into an own, its own education company, it's also a remote company. It's also you know automated and, and scalable. So I choose to do businesses that don't need me to be in a physical place because the idea exchange was the opposite. The idea exchange forced me to be in a specific location for the whole year round. And that was frustrating. You know, I, I wanted to build something remote and idea exchange didn't allow me to do that. And that was one of the reasons why I had to let it go. But hmm. I, but it took me from there, from 2015, it took me another two and a half, three years to be able to figure out how to work as I travel. And then it took me another year and a half to figure out what business I wanted to do, you know, after I wanted to start. And and that's why I got the idea like, okay, well, I'll start in Singapore and the team will be remote. So that's been very helpful because I haven't had to worry about the pandemic. Like it didn't, it didn't hurt our business at all. It didn't cause us to have to change the operations of the business because we had started remote. So our mentality and our daily operations, nothing changed. Um, and that was very, very beneficial. So, um, when, when I think about going to different countries and quote unquote, starting over, I love the challenge because in essence, I'm starting to build a network, right? I've, I built a network in Greece. I met, uh, so one of the people who's invested in, uh, a fund out of Switzerland that's invested in nerve is from Greece. So while I was there, I got to meet her very, very interesting woman, her company, uh, build ships. Like literally they build ships from the ground up in Greece. Incredible business. Um, and I got to meet my friend's friends. One of them is a multimillionaire doing real estate in Greece. Um, it was a family business he took over. So every country I go to, I get to meet really cool people. And now if I want to go back to those countries, I know those people. You know, I've already made friends with them. And if I meet somebody that might need those people, it's all, you know, it's all networking. Like as, you, as we've been talking about this whole time, it's like, I, I don't see it as something difficult because I've turned the process of starting over into a system. So I know every time I'm going to a new country, I just apply that system. It takes me, you know, probably seven or eight hours of work to get that done. But if I'm going to a place for two or three weeks or a month or whatever, I know exactly what to do in order to get into the local economy and the local community very quickly and to le lead a local lifestyle almost immediately. And in doing so, I put myself in a position where I get to meet really great people very quickly and I get to you know make good friends and I get to have awesome experiences. For example, I was invited to a Greek wedding. You know, If I went to Greece not knowing anybody, I would have never been invited to a Greek wedding. But I got to go to a Greek wedding and it was incredible. And the wine was amazing. And the, the cake and the food and the dancing and the music, it was all it was all wonderful. And I would have never had that experience if I, you know, hadn't met that person. Uh, you, you may have met him before. His name is Yanis. He's a Greek guy in China. Okay. Um, yeah, he's a good he's a good friend of mine. I met him in China. You know, we were friends there for years and he left, you know, I left China five years ago. He left China two years ago because of COVID. I hadn't seen him in four years. So I decided I would go to Greece and we met up there and, you know, 
uh, his birthday was a few days after I was supposed to leave. And he's like, Hey, you know, if you don't mind, like, I would love to have you here for my birthday. And I was like, yeah, I extended my, my trip a few extra days there. Well, and on like the night before or two nights before I was supposed to leave, he's like, Oh, by the way, there's a wedding. You want to come? And I was like, hell yeah. I want to go to a big fat Greek wedding, you know? So I, I don't, I don't see it as a challenge. I see it as, as exciting, you know, to start over. Yes. Yes, definitely, you know, I mean, you know, I'm I would be excited when I was listening to what you're talking. Um, I find I find sometimes, you know, um, for me, I mentioned to you personally, right? Like, uh, sometimes like for women, especially, you know, here in Asia, like you, you always have to think about what is the next three to five years. And mm. so not just for business, but at the same time for personal life, let's say, um, you know, Ines and my friends, they already got kicks baby. So we have to start thinking about, okay, <laughs> can you really you know, do whatever you want and traveling different country and city? And I think that is one of the challenges. And as a woman, they might would think about. I think you can have that but it starts with making yourself not necessary on a daily basis. So if you can build up the team and you can build up the revenue where they can help build up the revenue so that you don't need to be part of the daily operations of the company, then you can start a family. You can have a baby and you can still go travel. It's <laughs> just, it, it, it just requires having that mindset, having that plan and taking the steps to make it happen. Yeah, yeah, I think you mentioned a good point. Start getting it planted. So, um, traveling plan as well. Yeah, you know, one of the things is like, you might realize that the the pool of men in Hong Kong aren't like what interests you. You know, maybe if you want to be in Europe, maybe the, the person that you meet, maybe they're living in Switzerland, maybe they're living in Monaco or Luxembourg or one of those other places where, you know, they're ambitious and, and doing businesses and they're multimillionaires and people that, you know, you want to be around. So, you know, or maybe you meet a really simple guy in the middle of Greece and you're like, holy crap, you're handsome. Let's get married and have babies, you know? Uh, I'm, I'm going to Qatar maybe in Q4. I'm doing some events there. Cool. Yeah. yeah. So maybe Qatar. you'll maybe you'll meet a Qatari. <laughs> <laughs> You're invited. 